But let's talk to Gareth Bacon, MP. He's live with us down on College Green, Conservative MP for Orpington, uh, because we need to ask Gareth about what's been going on inside the mind of Sadiq Khan, the man who keeps telling us that 4,000 people die of air pollution every year. He issued a, a tweet the other day saying that in poor areas, the air pollution's worse than it is uh, in richer areas. Not quite sure how he's worked that one out, but let's ask Gareth. Gareth, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Yeah, very well indeed. I mean, we're talking a lot about science this morning and whether some science is better than other science. Uh, looking back, of course, at the three-year anniversary of, uh, uh, of the lockdown happening, um, it seems to me that politicians seem to use scientific data uh, to suit their purposes when they feel like it. Well, some do. Uh, I think that's probably <laughs> fair to say because... The, the, the thing about science is that most people in this country are not scientists, so uh, they would find it very difficult to contest it. Um, and you'll see if people say we need to follow the science for something, whatever the end may be, mm. that is almost the, uh, the trump card that can beat any argument, because unless you are scientifically qualified or you have a deep scientific understanding, you feel like you can't argue with it without yes. looking stupid. Yes, but the trouble is an awful lot of the science that they say is science actually isn't science, is it? I mean, as we saw with some of the modelling that went on during during COVID, and as we're now seeing with Sadiq Khan and his ULES uh, expansion plans, he keeps quoting this figure of 4,000 people dying of air pollution every single year, but he doesn't really have any data to back that up. Um, and in fact, it's now being challenged openly. Yes, well, the, the 4,000 figure uh, is, is the result of modelling that was done quite a long time ago. And what he's done is he's shifted the argument because when that w figure originally was released, it was 4,000 people, air pollution may contribute to a, an earlier death than that they would otherwise have. Um, and he has changed the word contribute to cause. So people are now thinking, well, 4,000 people are dying directly as a result yeah. of air pollution. And, of course, he is trying to blame the private motorist uh, for the cause of that air pollution. And actually, we know that where there is air pollution, it's not private vehicles that is the primary contributor. It's a range of areas. And, of course, the other thing is that when, when people die, uh, it depends on their age. They may die of a multitude of different factors. So, for example, in my own uh, borough, the London Borough of Bromley, he likes to say that 204 people every year are killed by air pollution. Well, that's not true. Uh, Bromley has the, the most elderly population in the whole of Greater London. Yes. A lot of them die of old age and the symptoms associated with old age. To mm. say that air pollution has killed them is a gross exaggeration, to say the least. Yes. Also, we live in, in London. Uh, it's a multi-faceted city. It has all manner of different parts of it, which some are more green than yes. others. Um, but rather, mm -hmm. I would imagine that we all share the same air. You know, I don't know how it's possible for him to make out that poorer areas suffer more from air pollution than richer areas, because how does he know that? Well, I think he's probably making the jump that uh, poorer areas tend to be the most built-up areas. So uh, you would go to certain parts of, say, Kensington or Camden or places like that where the, air, where the area is much more built up and there's uh, less area for uh, whatever air pollution there is to disperse. If you were to come somewhere like Orpington, two-thirds of it is green field. If yeah. you looked at it from an aerial map, you would see a sea of green everywhere. So right. any air pollution that is generated, it's e easier to dissipate. So I think that's probably the argument that he's making, but I haven't seen any scientific data that he's produced that backs that up. Well, exactly right. But also, the air isn't really contained, is it? I mean, I'm sorry if I sound a bit unscientific here, but, you know, mm. I've lived in Camden, um, and you can walk down Camden yeah. High Street, uh, and you can walk for ten minutes mm. and find yourself on Primrose Hill, uh, where it's rather nice. Now, uh, it may well be yes. that because and you're standing in the middle of a road that you're getting more exhaust fumes yeah. there, but I don't know that, you know, as a borough, it's suddenly more polluted than others. No, I mean, there are measures that have been done, I think, by Imperial College, um, and they do rank the various different London boroughs. So I know, for example, that the London Borough of Bromley has marginally less clean air than the London Borough of Havering, but their numbers one and two, respectively, mm. uh, in the whole of Greater London. Um, so it will vary from place to place, but, you know, it has occurred to me more than once. I listen to Sadiq Khan talking as though we're all living in this sort of gigantic gas chamber yeah. where we're all breathing in poisonous air. It's going to terminate our lives. I'm over 50 years old, and I've lived in Greater London for just about all of my life. And I've worked in central London since I was 18, and I don't seem to be dead. So <laughs> I, I can't quite work out how he is making that leap. And, of course, he lives and works in central London, and he's older than me. So, right. you know, uh, I, his argument seems to fall down the minute you start probing it. Yeah. And the, uh, the various different uh, boroughs, uh, many of them uh, you'll know in, in the sort of southeast of the, of the corner of the outskirts of London, and also some in the north and, and mm. in Essex as well, are, are standing up against it. They're, they're mounting some kind of a yes. legal challenge, and, and, and they're hoping yes. to be able to stop uh, the expansion of the ULES, which I think is supposed to happen in a couple of months' time. I also noted that in the last few weeks or last few weekends, people have started covering up some cameras, so there's a bit of civic resistance going on as well. Mm. 
Well, there's quite a lot from what I've heard. I mean, I've heard about cameras being covered over. There was an amusing photograph uh, of a cardboard box that had been put yes. over the camera somewhere with um, Stop Electing Idiots written on it, <laughs> uh, which I thought was, was marginally entertaining. Um, I, I have heard that cameras have been uh, vandalised. Mm. The wires have been cut, some of them have been torn down. Mm. And obviously, I don't advocate that. But I do understand why some people are feeling so aggrieved by this, because they're seeing a, a massive imposition being put onto their, the way they live their lives for no reason at all. And this is the, the absolutely key point. I keep talking about the Jacobs report, which was produced as part of Sadiq Khan's consultation. It was an independent report, so he could not control the outcome. And they assessed the uh, air quality benefit of him rolling out the ultra-low emission zone to Greater London and came back and said it would be minor to negligible in almost every regard. Mm. So he's doing this, claiming it's about air pollution, and it isn't. And everyone knows what it really is about. It's really about raising hundreds of millions of pounds mm. by fleecing motorists. Yes, and he's already doing that. I mean, what on earth is he doing with all the money that he gets already? Because, I mean, the congestion charge, the, the ULES charge, which is already in place, must produce hundreds of millions yep. of pounds. What's he doing with it? Well, the truth is, of course, that Transport for London is struggling financially. It struggled during the pandemic because people stopped using their services because they were under lockdown and staying at home. Um, but, of course, th there's other reasons as well. He imposed a fares freeze for the first four years, despite knowing that he couldn't afford it. And he bungled Crossrail. And that's very important because mm. Crossrail would have raised by now billions of pounds in fares revenue that wasn't realised because it wasn't open. Right. So TfL is way behind where they need to be financially. Uh, and he's looking for extra ways to raise revenue and he settled on the ultra low emission zone and so it's quite a wheeze because he can disguise what he's doing by claiming that it's on environmental grounds and it's about air quality but we all know that it's not no quite right and just finally gareth on on the third anniversary of of, of lockdown um and uh, that, that seems incredible that it's been that long ago really three years has passed incredibly quickly yep. um a lot of people saying to me this morning that you know we must learn from what happened we must never do it again um Whatever went before, you know, nobody necessarily must be held account for, uh, accountable for it. But but the, but there needs to be a proper inquiry, and there needs to be proper um, probing. I think not the sort of stuff we saw yesterday, but you know, genuine questions being asked to mm. members of the government as to why they did certain things. Well, I think that that's fair. I mean, that's why the government agreed to set up a, a COVID inquiry. Because, I mean, obviously it was one of the, the, the most seismic things that's happened in any of our lifetimes. And I think it's perfectly right to go back and look at that and look at the decisions that were made. But I think it does need to be done in context. Because when the pandemic first started to strike around the world, there was incomplete information. There was a lot of fear. Uh, and people didn't know what they were dealing with. And so some of the measures that the government introduced at that time were in that context. I think now, three years on. It's very easy to sit back and look and, and look at it and say, well, of course that was wrong and this was wrong and that was wrong. Um, and, and I understand that because I believe me, I, I didn't enjoy lockdown like everybody else. It was a, a terrible time and sort of mentally I've blocked some of it out because I don't like to think about it. Yeah. Um, so I think it is important to have the inquiry, but I think it's also important whilst we're having the inquiry to appreciate the context in which decisions were made. Because I don't think decisions were being made in bad faith. I think they were being made with the best of intentions, whether they were right or wrong. I think that's something the inquiry can, can wrinkle out. Indeed. Gareth, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Gareth Bacon, MP, Conservative uh, for Alpington there, which is one of the areas affected by the expansion zone uh, for ULES, the ultra-low emission zone that Sadiq Khan uh, wants to operate uh, even on the outskirts of London, not just inside of it. And, of course, there's massive opposition to it.